Good morning, everyone. God bless you. It's great to see you this morning. So glad that you came to worship the Lord with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We've been working our way through this letter of Paul. Uh, dropped off over Christmas and we're picking it back up. We have some exciting things ahead in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Talking about communion. Talking about the love chapter. Talking about uh, the hope of our our hope of resurrection in Christ. Uh, many exciting things. Right now we're in the middle of the letter and uh, we're going to talk this morning about finding our focus. Finding our focus. 1 Corinthians 7. While you're finding your way there, a couple quick things. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you that yesterday uh, began a season of prayer and fasting for our congregation uh, from January 10th to January 30th for 21 days. Um, we're asking you to set aside some time to fast and pray with us just to inquire of the Lord at the start of this new year, especially on my heart, uh, is to fast and pray for prodigals, that 2015 would be the year that prodigal husbands, that prodigal wives, that prodigal children, uh, grandchildren uh, come back to Jesus, come back to Father's house. And uh, so there are many different expressions of fasting, durations of fasting. Pastor Nick has written a little paper about it um, just to help you. If, if you need more information about fasting, you can grab that off the Welcome Center or we can send it to you electronically. If you just send an, an uh, email to our office, we'll be happy to send that to you. And you can take a look at it and pray about spending some time fasting. Jesus said that fasting is one of the essentials of the Christian life. He said, when you pray, when you give, and when you fast. So do that with us. And that's all leading up to Friday evening, January 30th. That's going to be our first fire in the night of the new year. We're going to start at 6 p.m. on Friday, January 30th. We're going to go right through the night till 6 o'clock on Saturday morning. We're going to have worship teams here all through the night and people leading in different segments of prayer. And uh, we hope you'll just come whenever you can get here and stay as long as you'd like to stay and just spend some time in prayer with us. Then I want to just bring you some good news from our construction project. As you can see, the hole is getting bigger outside. Um, we're going to lose our front entrance any day now uh, as they start digging to where the two buildings are going to connect. But the great news is that we have gotten down to the level we need to be uh, in the main part of the excavation and uh, we have hit much less rock than we were anticipating hitting. Uh, we thought we might have to hammer, we thought we might have to blast, which is all very, very expensive and we have had to do none of that. Um, we give thanks to the Lord. <clears throat> We we thought we might have to uh, we thought we might hit a lot of groundwater. There's a lot of groundwater issues in this neck of the woods, and we have no water problem. And so we had engineered sort of for the worst case scenario, and things are so favorable that we have been able to go back and re-engineer a little bit. And the net result is we've saved ourselves many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we give thanks to the Lord for that. And that's all good news. Um, we're going we're gonna to start making holes all over the place. So um, the, that's the good news. The bad news is we have to dig a 25-foot trench all the way across the middle of the parking lot where you park right now um, to get a drain out to the back of the property. And so um, things are really going to get a little crazy around here. So just take your time as you move around the property. Um, moms and dads, please keep an eye on your kids. Everybody help us keep an eye on the kids so that nobody falls in a hole where they're not supposed to be. And uh, we'll be okay. And keep on praying. And thank you for sharing your gifts. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is a really tricky chapter of scripture. Um, and the Lord's going to help us to sort of sort it out and make some sense of it uh, this morning. I'm going to start reading 1 Corinthians 7. Pastor Nick started this chapter before Christmas. Let's pick up in verse 10 and let's talk about finding our focus. 1 Corinthians 7 starting in verse 10. To the married, uh, by married, Paul means married couples that happen to be in the congregation, both believers. To the married, I give this command. Not I, but the Lord. Paul is quoting Jesus now. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest. By the rest, Paul means people where there's one uh, a believing husband in the congregation that doesn't have a believing wife or vice versa. I say this, I not the Lord, he's not quoting Jesus anymore, but he's applying Jesus' words. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. 
And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances, for God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Look at verse 17, because this is the crux of, of this passage. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is now the Lord's free man. Similarly, the one who was free when he was called is now Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Verse 25, now about virgins. By virgins, Paul means single people, people who have never been married. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Don't seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Don't look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you from this. You can add an LOL right there in, in <laughs> scripture. Just write it right in, LOL. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. Uh, jump down to verse 31. Those who use the things of this world should not be engrossed in them, for the world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. Again, you can add an LOL. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you might live in the right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. We won't read the rest of the chapter, but Paul goes on to address people who are engaged to be married and uh, contemplating marriage and wondering whether they should marry, and we'll talk about that. I want to just say that we're going to touch this morning on some very personal issues, uh, some of the most intimate issues of our lives, and I want to challenge you to receive with an open heart the word of God. James wrote to us and he said, receive with humility the seed of the word that God wants to plant in your heart because it's able to save your soul. So I want you to open your heart. Um, if something I say makes you angry this morning, um, it might mean that there's an issue that you need to take to the Lord, but um, we're going to receive God's word. Are you ready to receive it? All right, come on, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. You gave your only son for us. And I pray, Father, that we would receive today with humility the good seed of your word in the soil of our heart. Father, I pray that it would take root there, that it would produce fruit. Father, I pray we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen. You know, as I think about the church in America today, I find that things have gotten out of focus a bit. For many, it seems that the focus of their faith has become personal empowerment. The, person, the, the focus of their faith has become maximized human potential. Be all that you can be. For some, the focus has become upward mobility, as if Jesus is a stairway to earthly success. For others, the focus has become to live a well-rounded, neatly balanced, self-satisfying life. But I want to tell you that Jesus is much more than a self-help guru. Jesus is much more than a motivational speaker. He is much more than your personal success coach, and he is certainly 
much more than an accessory. Jesus is our Savior, and He is Lord. You see, God didn't sacrifice His only Son merely to save us from a life of mediocrity. He didn't, Jesus didn't suffer and bleed out on the cross merely to rescue us from a life of under-realized potential as if nothing could be worse than that. The author of life tasted death in order to save us out of a condition for which there is no self-help. Jesus died to save us from our sins and from the eternal consequences of our sins. He died so that we might receive eternal life through faith in Him. And since we are now alive with Him, we live the rest of our earthly lives for Him. You see, it is no longer about my personal ambition, but it is now all about His mission. Looking at chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, I find that we are not the only believers to struggle with the issue of focus. The Corinthians were struggling with it too. They had lots of questions about how their new faith in Christ might help them improve the circumstances in their lives that were less than ideal. Now that I belong to Jesus, can I get out of my unhappy marriage? Now that I belong to Jesus, can I get out from underneath my overbearing boss? Can I set my sights on moving up in the world? Can I make something out of myself? And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul answers that their focus is all wrong. You see, as believers, our focus is not supposed to be on our earthly circumstances, but on Christ. Looking at Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, I find three things to focus on as believers. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three things to focus on as followers of Jesus. First of all, focus on your calling to a new way of living in Christ. Focus on your calling to a new way of living in Christ. There are three great truths in 1 Corinthians 7 that give us really important perspective on our present circumstances. The first truth is this. God has assigned us each to something different in life. Stop cursing your circumstances. Stop rebuking your circumstances. Your circumstances are not the devil's confinement. They are actually God's assignment. In Acts chapter 17, Paul says that God has assigned us each to something different. He says that God has assigned us each to different ethnicities. He has assigned us to live in a precise moment in history. He has assigned us to be born in the exact country, in the exact city, to the exact family, and in the exact situation into which we were born. He's assigned us to a specific place in society, to a specific socioeconomic status, to a specific sphere of activity and influence. He assigned me to be an Irish-American mutt from the suburbs of Philly, the son of an elementary school principal and a ballet teacher. He assigned my wife to be a Ukrainian thoroughbred from a Tony suburb of Toronto, the daughter of farmers who became printers. He assigned some of us to be Italian-American and to feed the rest of us. <laughs> he assigned some of us to be African-American. He assigned some of us to be Asian-American. He assigned some of us to be Jewish and some to be British, some to be Hispanic, some to be Portuguese, some to be Brazilian, some to be Filipino, some to be African, Indian, European, Eastern European. He assigned some of us to be butchers. And some of us to be bakers and some of us to be candlestick makers. He assigned some of us to be from the upper class and some of us to be from the middle class and some of us to be from the working class. He assigned some of us to be born in the 30s, some in the 40s, some in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, some in the 2000s. He assigned some of us to be from the sticks and some of us to be from the burbs and some of us to be from the hood. Listen, 
He assigned some of us to be male and he assigned some of us to be female and he made no mistake in those assignments. God assigned us each to different circumstances. And then he called us to salvation in Christ in the midst of those circumstances. In fact, he probably used those circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to bring us to faith in Jesus. And beloved, listen to this truth from the word of God. It's a hard truth because it cuts right across the grain of our American idealism. It cuts right across the grain of most of American Christianity today. But it is God's word. What God has called us to in Christ is not necessarily new circumstances. But to a new way of living within our circumstances. Do you follow me? If God assigned you to be Italian-American, your salvation in Christ doesn't make you un-Italian-American. It means that you are now a Christian Italian-American, so put the water on and show us how it's done. <laughs> if God assigned you to be a carpenter, your salvation in Christ doesn't mean that you should become an ex-carpenter. It means you are now a Christian carpenter, so sharpen your pencil and show us how it's done. If God assigned you to be from the hood, it doesn't mean that your salvation in Christ means you should leave the hood. It means you're now a Christian in the hood, so pull your pants up and show us how it's done. Please, pull your pants up. Paul is saying, stop focusing on your circumstances. And focus instead on how God wants you to live for Christ in the midst of the circumstances to which he has assigned you and to which he has called you. Three times, you know, whenever the Bible repeats something, if a word is repeated, if a, a phrase is repeated uh, several times in a short space, it means it's, it's shouting at you. There was no italics, there was no uh, highlighter, there was no different color font. So the way they just made it scream was to repeat it three times. In the space of seven verses, Paul tells us to remain. Verse 17, nevertheless, each man should remain in the place, in life that the Lord has assigned him to with God, it says. Verse 20, each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Verse 24, each one as responsible to God should remain in the situation to which God called him. That word remain is interesting. That word remain means stand strong. That word remain means to hold your ground. It means to plant your feet. It means to be unmovable. That word remain means to endure. It means to persevere. It means to prevail. I have a new friend in the Lord. His name is Dominic Novak and he's the owner of Peak Physique here in Greenwich. And after my sermon last week about cheeseburgers, 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 he came up to me after service and he said, Pastor Glenn, let me help you a little bit. By the way, thank you for all the pictures that you sent me of you eating cheeseburgers on Sunday afternoon. I think it's a perfect example of failed communication. The point was you were not supposed to eat the cheeseburgers. <laughs> but after I talked about cheeseburgers, he said, Pastor Glenn, let me help you a little bit. So I went to Peak Physique for a training session this week. And it didn't start at all the way I expected. I thought it might take out the calipers and measure my body fat. I thought he might put me on a treadmill and see how woefully out of shape I really am. But instead, it started with him teaching me how to stand properly. It started with learning good posture and balance. Denise was chomping at the bit to hear about how badly he beat me up when I got home. And I said, eh, I said it basically stood around the whole time. <laughs> but I never realized all this time how wrong I've been standing until somebody showed me how to stand properly. I never realized how much concentration and effort it takes to correct an improper stance. Never realize what a difference it makes if you're standing properly, doing all the routines that you've done before. And yes, I worked up quite a sweat and I am now quite sore simply from standing around. And maybe that helps us to understand the heart of this very tricky passage in 1 Corinthians. God wants us to learn how to stand properly in Christ. Stand 
in the place in life to which the Lord has assigned you with God. He wants us to experience the difference that standing properly in him makes in all the routines of our life. And eventually, he wants to show off our results to others. So while teaching me how to stand, Dominic had me concentrate on the proper placement of my feet. He had me concentrate on the position of my hips and my abs and my shoulders and my head. And my assignment is to practice standing every day this week. So how do we practice standing with God in the midst of our present circumstances? A few things I see here. One thing is this. Focus on living in the beautiful freedom that comes from enslavement to Christ. Paul addresses in these verses the intolerable situation of slavery. Beloved, don't you find it amazing that for all of our enlightenment, for all of our discoveries, for all of our advances, for all of our ideals, for all of our rhetoric, don't you find it amazing that slavery is still very much alive and well in the world today? In fact, it is said that there are more people in bondage to slavery today than at any other single point in human history. Some 30 plus million people around the world, many of them young women who are victims of sex trafficking or who are sold into forced marriages. Paul says if a slave can gain his freedom, he should do so. And it is absolutely right for us as followers of Jesus to do everything we can to help people get their freedom. By the way, I want you to know that every abolitionist movement that has ever been launched around the world has been launched by followers of Jesus. But Paul says there is a spiritual slavery that is far more ominous than earthly slavery. And there is a spiritual liberation that is far more glorious than earthly liberation. As bad as earthly slavery is, and it is truly bad, slavery to sin and to Satan is a far worse condition. And as wonderful as earthly freedom is, freedom in Christ is far better yet. So listen, this is what Paul is saying. Catch this, because you have a circumstance in your life that is causing you anxiety right now, that is stressing you out, that is, is burdening your heart. Listen, what Paul is saying, even in the midst of the most oppressive earthly circumstances, there is an inner freedom that we can experience in Christ that nothing can take away from us. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. You are now the Lord's free person. So listen to me, beloved. I guess if even slavery is a life circumstance not to fret about, then pretty much anything else that you or I might be going through here in the good old U.S. of A. is easy peasy by comparison. Rather than focusing on our outward circumstance, let's focus on belonging to the Lord. Paul said, to be the Lord's free person means to be Christ's slave. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. With the price of his own blood, Jesus bought me out of slavery to sin and to Satan. And I am now free, not to be a free agent and do anything I please, but I am now free to be his love slave. How do we practice standing with God in the midst of our present circumstances? Another thing I find is to focus on pleasing the Lord. From verse 25 onward, Paul talks about the decision whether to marry someone. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. But Paul says here that the most important thing in all of our decision making is to focus on pleasing the Lord. How different would the outcomes of our life be in 2015 if we would only stop before we make a decision and ask, what does the Lord want me to do? Paul says in Ephesians, live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Finding out what pleases the Lord is a study that would take us all over the Bible, but Paul gives us two things right here in 1 Corinthians 7 to get us started. One is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit, and the other is to be undivided in our devotion to him. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul addresses many issues related to marriage. He addresses people who are currently married. 
He addresses people who were formerly married and are married no longer. He addresses people who are in mixed marriages, a believing spouse married to an unbelieving spouse. He addresses single people who have never been married and he addresses people who are engaged to be married. And listen to me, beloved. Receive with humility the seed of the word to those who are not currently married. Whether they be widowed, whether they be divorced, separated, whether they be living with someone, whether they be engaged or dating, Paul says that devotion to the Lord in body and in spirit means abstinence from sex. It means celibacy. Beloved, please listen to me. If you are not married and you are engaging in sex, you are acting in direct disobedience to the Lord. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord if you don't do the things that I say? John said, this is how we know we love him. If we keep his commandments and his commandments are not a burden to us. And listen, if this is your situation this morning, I am not trying to condemn you, but I am trying to correct you. I am trying to warn you with sincere concern. I am trying to plead with you. Because what you're doing is not pleasing to the Lord. It's not a situation that he can or he will overlook. It's not a situation that he can or he will bless. And listen, someone needs to hear this. Your service to the Lord on one side will not cancel out your willful disobedience to the Lord on another side. That is not the way things work in his kingdom. Either he is Lord of all or he is not Lord of all at all. And if that's your situation, God simply wants you to repent. God wants to rescue you out of that situation. You don't even know you need rescue, but you need it. God wants to give you a permanent remedy to that situation so that you can be fulfilled and blessed. To those who are currently married, Paul says that undivided devotion to the Lord means fidelity to your marriage bond. It means promoting the health of your marriage in every way, particularly by not withholding sex from your spouse. It also means not putting your spouse and your family ahead of the Lord. You know, I think that's a major issue in many Christian families today. To be honest with you, their vision for their family looks a lot more like the American dream than a biblical dream. They have this image that they're pursuing of a well-rounded, neatly balanced life of which Jesus and his church are just a part. But I have to tell you, I don't find anywhere that Jesus ever called us to live a well-rounded life. I only find that he called us to live a crucified life. That means a life of radical surrender, a life of radical devotion, a life of radical service to him. How do we practice standing with God in the midst of our present circumstances? Another thing I find is to focus on the obedience that comes by faith. The Corinthian Christians were a little confused over the practice of circumcision. Some of them were Jewish and they became believers in Yeshua, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. And they thought that perhaps in order to please the Lord they had to cover up their circumcision. Some of them were Gentiles and they thought that perhaps since Jesus was the Jewish Messiah that they should get circumcised in order to please the Lord. But Paul says that circumcision doesn't mean anything to the Lord. What matters is keeping his commandments. Beloved, listen to me. Acts of religious devotion, religious rituals, religious duties, they don't impress the Lord. What he wants is for us to learn how to stand properly in our everyday life. But you know, that's something that we can't do in our own strength. Take the command here for unmarried people to remain celibate. You might be listening and saying to yourself, you know, that's impossible. After all, God made me a sexual being. We live in a sex-saturated, sex-crazed culture. Everybody's doing it. I want to tell you, you're right. It is impossible on your own. But the kind of obedience in which we live is the kind that grows in us from the inside out through the power of the Holy Spirit by faith. And if you want to know about, more about how that works, you can get the CD from last week about cheeseburgers. <laughs>
How do we practice standing with the Lord in the midst of our present circumstances? Another thing I find is to focus on preparation for the life to come. Beloved, listen to me. One of the reasons that our earthly circumstances mean so little is that from heaven's perspective, they are so temporary. Paul says the time is short, so don't be engrossed in the things of this world because they are quickly passing away. God's calling to salvation gives us a radical new perspective on the balance of our earthly life. The goal of all of this life is to get ready for that moment when we step into his presence. The great revivalist Jonathan Edwards when he drew his last breath, it said that a huge smile spread across his face. And he said, there is Jesus of Nazareth, my true and my never failing friend. And then he said to his daughter Lucy, who was by his side, trust in God, you don't have to be afraid. You see, that's the goal. The goal is to be ready to meet him face to face. The goal is to grow in intimacy with him so that in that moment I recognize him and he recognizes me. The, grow, the goal is to grow more and more like him so I'm compatible to be by his side forever. To those who are not currently married, Paul says, if you don't have the gift of living celibate, then get married because it is better to marry than to burn. You know, I've always understood Paul to mean that it's better to marry than to burn with desire. That's the way I was taught. So you can imagine my surprise when I discovered that the majority of New Testament theologians that I follow, that I read, believe that burn actually refers to the eternal destiny of people who live in disobedience to the Lord. I don't know what is the right interpretation of that word burn, but Paul leaves no doubt in our minds that this is a matter of eternal consequence. We read Paul's words in chapter 6, do not be self-deceived, sexually immoral people, fornicators, that means people who have sex outside of marriage, adulterers, that means people who break their marriage covenant, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, that includes people who get high, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That means they will not enter into heaven. Thank God that he doesn't leave it there. He goes on, he says, such were some of you, but now you have been washed. Now you have been sanctified. Now you have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. This is what you were, but you are not that anymore. So focus on being what you are. Three things to focus on as followers of Jesus. Focus on your calling to a new way of life in Christ. Second, focus on the salvation of your family members and those in your orbit. There are three great truths in this chapter that give us helpful perspective on our circumstances. Truth number one is God has assigned us each to something different in life. Truth number two is that the circumstances that God has called us in are the circumstances that he has called us to minister to. Now, I'm pretty sure that's poor grammar, but it's good preaching. You see, we're constantly asking God, Lord, please take me out of these circumstances. But God is saying to us, not so fast. I called you in these circumstances, not to take you out of these circumstances, but to minister to others who are in these circumstances with you. Joseph's pit looked like the enemy's confinement, but it was really the Lord's assignment. The slave trading caravan from Midian that was on its way to Egypt looked like the enemy's confinement, but it was the Lord's assignment. Potiphar's house looked like the enemy's confinement, but it was the Lord's assignment. The Egyptian prison looked like the enemy's confinement, but it was the Lord's assignment. Stop bucking against your circumstances. Stop fighting. Stop kicking. Stop cursing. Stop rebuking your circumstances. They are not the enemy's confinement. They are the Lord's assignment. And that is nowhere 
more true than in your own family. Listen to me, your family is your first assignment from the Lord. Paul addresses the problem of mixed marriages and families. One spouse is a believer, the other is not. Perhaps some kids are believers and the others are not. I grew up in that kind of a divided house. My mom and my middle sister and I were believers in Jesus. My dad and my older sister were not. And that division created a lot of tension in our family. It created a lot of distance in our family. Some of you are living in that very same situation right now. And Paul gives some incredibly encouraging words to people who are in divided houses. First of all, Paul says that God has a special mark on the unbelieving members of a believer's family. Paul says here that because of you, they are set apart by God. That's what the word holy, the word sanctified means. It means God has put a mark on them and he has set them aside. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus, there is a great promise for you. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved and your whole house. Don't settle for anything less than that. And listen, because of you, James says, you are the first fruits in your family. You are the first of many of the same kind to come in your household. Because you're a believer in Jesus, God has his eye on the unbelievers in your family. God has his hand on them. God is watching over them. God is protecting them. They don't even know it. But God is all around them. God is pursuing them. God is wooing them. Because of you, they can't get away from him. They can run, but they cannot hide. That's why we're fasting right now for prodigals. Another encouraging thing that Paul says is that their uncleanness will not infect you, but your holiness will disinfect them. You know, Jewish people weren't allowed to touch unclean things. They weren't allowed to touch dead things. They weren't allowed to touch blood. They weren't allowed to touch diseased things. There's a chapter in the Gospels where Jesus touched all three of those things in one chapter with the trifecta of Jewish uncleanness. But guess what? Every time Jesus touched something unclean, he didn't become unclean. The unclean thing became clean. And that's the same thing with you, the believer. You're the believer in your house. They will not infect you. You will disinfect them. In chapter 6, Paul says that when two people join their bodies together, a spiritual union occurs. A spiritual transaction takes place. And listen, if one person is oppressed by an evil spirit, that thing can transfer over to the person that they're joined with. If you're a believer and you're having sex outside of the covenant of marriage, you are not protected. You are exposing yourself to whatever ooga booga is in the other person. And I want to tell you, we've seen it happen. We've had to pray over people who gotten themselves into a mess. But listen to me, within the context of marriage, God protects the believing spouse so that whatever is in the unbelieving spouse cannot harass them. They will not infect you. You will disinfect them. So how do we win unbelieving spouses and unbelieving children to Christ? Paul says we do that simply by standing with God in the midst of that difficult circumstance. By standing properly, by holding our ground, by enduring, by persevering. You know, it's not the words that you say that will win them over. It's the word that you live in front of them that will win them over. How do you know, wife, whether you'll save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you'll save your wife? Now listen, if you are living in a divided house, God may remove you at some point from that circumstance. Paul says that sometimes the unbelieving spouse wants to go because of the believer's relationship with Christ. And he says, in that place, let the unbeliever go because God has called you to live in peace. And it may be that God will remove you from that situation at some point. But in the meantime, pray that God uses you in the midst of your circumstance.
And what applies to marriage applies to every part of our life. At some point, God may remove you from the difficult circumstance that you're in today. He might remove you from your boss, who's the devil. He might remove you from your coworkers, who are his minions. He might remove you from the hood. But in the meantime, ask God to minister to those that are with you in that circumstance. Three things to focus on as followers of Jesus. Worship team, come and help me. Focus on your calling to a new living in Christ. Focus on the salvation of your family and those in your orbit. And finally, focus on making good decisions moving forward. You know, there's something amazing about Jesus that Paul affirms here in these verses. It's that Jesus meets us wherever we're at in life. And Jesus doesn't chastise us for what came before. But instead, Jesus concentrates on giving us grace to move forward standing the right way. You know, when Jesus met the woman at the well, he didn't sit down and ask her, now tell me, explain to me, how is it that you came to be divorced five times? And how is it that you're now living with man number six? Explain to me, tell me, how, how is it that you got yourself into such a revolving door of broken relationships? Tell me how that happened. Jesus didn't sit down and bother about everything that came before. Instead, he simply said to the woman, go call your partner and let's get the two of you straightened out and let's get you out of this mess. Beloved, listen to me. Whatever decisions you've made in life that have led you to your present circumstance, those things are not nearly as important to God as making good decisions from this point forward to move ahead in Him. And Paul tells us why good decisions are so critically important. For one thing, he tells us that life is hard enough already without complicating it further by a bad decision. Paul is talking here about the decision whether to marry someone. And apart from Christ, what could possibly be a more important decision than whom you marry? And he says, be sure to make a good decision because there are enough troubles in life already. Socrates said, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you will become happy. If you get a bad wife, you will become a philosopher. That pretty much tells us everything we need to know about Mrs. Socrates, doesn't it? Paul says, I want to spare you from adding to your troubles. I want you to live, God wants you to live free from anxiety. God wants you to live in peace, it says. So make a good decision. Another reason why good decisions are so important is because life is just way too short to waste time stuck in a dead-end situation. Paul says time is short. And I don't know whether you found it to be true, but I find you blink and half a lifetime has gone by and you don't even know where it went. You know, when we came here in 1996, we gave a five-year commitment to be the associate pastors. My plan was to, to work under Pastor Tate for five years and then go plant a church of my own. And I blink, and the last 18 years has been the longest five years of my life. It just goes like that. And once you make a bad decision, you're stuck with the consequences of that decision for a very long time. Paul quotes Jesus when he says that the decision to marry is a binding decision in God's eyes. If you're a believer, it's a decision that you are stuck with for the rest of your life unless the other partner voids the marriage covenant. A third reason why good decisions are so critically important is that the things that the world values so urgently are so fleeting said unbelievers are driven by the compulsion to acquire things. They're driven by uh, the need to, to accumulate things that are frivolous in the light of eternity. He said they chase after food and drink. They chase after fine clothing. They chase after financial security and status. And they seek fulfillment in all of these things. 
And listen, if we're not careful, we can, we can get caught up in their psychoses so that we feel an urgency to chase after those things too. I have to have it now. But Jesus said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will give you everything you, you need in his time. Since there's so much in this chapter about marriage, I want to close with some advice from an author named Warren Wearsby about making the decision whether or not to marry someone. For all of our single people, uh, for everyone who might be in a relationship and considering whether to marry or not to marry, here are five things very quickly from the end of this chapter to consider if you're contemplating marriage. First of all, ask, what is my gift from God? I said there are three great truths in this chapter that give us perspective on our circumstances. The first truth is God has assigned us each to something different. The second truth is that the circumstances God has called us in are the circumstances he wants us to minister to. And the third truth is this. God has given us different gifts from the Holy Spirit to live for Christ within our circumstances. Paul says in verse 7 that some people have received the gift of marriage through the Holy Spirit and some people have received the gift of singleness through the Holy Spirit. Listen, these gifts don't come from ourselves. They come from the enabling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you better hang tight to me because without me, you can't do anything. But if you hold on to me, you can do anything. And listen, if God has called you to be single, then he has given you the gift of celibacy through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come in your own strength. It comes from him. And listen, this is for somebody here. Don't you say that you can't do what the word of God says that you can do. Don't you say that you can't do what God has sent his spirit into your heart to enable you to do. And if God has called you to be married, then he's going to give you the gift of loving your spouse. He's going to give you uh, the gift of, of promoting the health of your marriage, not in your own strength, but through the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Because what I've discovered about life is whether you're single or whether you're married, you can't do this thing without his help. So if you're considering marriage, ask, what is my gift? Second, ask, am I marrying a believer? Beloved, listen to me. Please hear the word of God and receive it with humility. If you are a believer in Jesus, Scripture commands you to marry another believer and forbids you from marrying an unbeliever. And God is not going to give you a special dispensation to do something different than what his word says. The Holy Spirit's the author of Scripture. He wrote it. He's not going to tell you a personal command that is contrary to his word. Number three, are the circumstances such that a marriage is right? If you're young and your parents are believers, do you have their blessing to marry? Do you have the blessing of your pastor? Do you have the blessing of mothers or fathers in Christ, mentors, teachers, people to whom you're accountable in the body of Christ? If you were previously married, do you have the right to remarry? If your boyfriend or girlfriend was previously married, does he or she have the right to remarry? Are you prepared to deal with some of the things that will come with that marriage? If you're blending a family, if there's kids on one side or the other or both from other relationships, are you prepared to deal with everything that comes with that? Is marriage a right choice? Number four, how will this marriage affect my service for Christ? Will you still be able to serve the Lord with undivided devotion if you marry this person? Let me give you a, a little hint. If he is minimally interested in the Lord now, he's probably not going to be more interested in the Lord after you marry. If she's not crazy about church now, she's probably not going to be more interested in coming after marriage. And in fact, it's going to be a contest for your loyalty. And finally, am I prepared to enter this marriage for life? Beloved, listen to me. God takes our decision to marry very, very seriously, and we should too. I have sat with couples who are contemplating marriage, and they've said to me, well, we'll give it a try. Give it a try? In the words of Mr. Miyagi, karate do yes or karate do no but karate I guess so and squish listen to me marriage 
yes or marriage do no but marriage I'll give it a try and you are going to get squished so as this new year gets rolling how should we think about our circumstances especially the ones that we wish would change rather than fretting about our circumstance let's focus on these three things our calling to live a new life in Christ the salvation of our family and those around us and making good decisions moving forward. Would you stand on your feet this morning and to give Jesus, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords a great big praise in this place.